My name is Laura Sibilia. I'm the Director of Economic Development for BDCC. Uh, we'd like to welcome you here today. Today's presentation is being streamed live on the SEVIDS Facebook page. Uh, that is So Vermont. I think all of you have uh, the address on the handout that we've given today. Uh, on Facebook, it's So Vermont. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge other host communities from across the country, including our colleagues from the Pilgrim Plant in Massachusetts and the Diablo Canyon Plant in California, who we know are joining us live today. For those viewing online, we will be taking questions following the presentation of today's white paper, and we will be monitoring questions posed online and attempting to answer all of them today here. Uh, we do have a pretty hard stop at 3 o'clock. Uh, for those questions that do come in, we'll be posting answers online. With that, I would like to introduce my boss, Executive Director of BDCC, Adam Grenold. Great, thank you. Uh, as a longtime SEVIDS board member and as the Executive Director of the Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation for the past two years, uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to welcome here, everyone here today. Senator Leahy, Congressman Welch, Assistant Secretary of Commerce Matt Erskine, as well as Chris Recchia from the Shumlin Administration and members of the Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts legislative delegations, dedicated VY task force members, and interested citizens. Thank you all for being in attendance here today. I also offer a warm welcome to our audience streaming in from around the country today. We are here today to share the lessons learned by the Tri-State Region team in the wake of the closure of the Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Station, known simply as VY locally. While the Wyndham Region is host to the nuclear power station itself, together the Tri-State Region is home to the vast majority of those who are employed by the plant and where the loss of the VY employees, employee income, as well as the indirect and induced job losses have been most acutely experienced. My thanks to the Franklin Regional Council of Governments in Massachusetts, to the Southwest Region Planning Commission in New Hampshire, and to our sister agency here in Vermont, Wyndham Regional Commission, for partnering with the BDCC and SEVIDS to compile these findings. While the discussion here today will relate specifically to the closure of a nuclear power plant in a rural area, the lessons learned are applicable to any locale that would or could lose a major employer, a, source of, a large source of local earned income, a major contributor to the local tax base, and a major contributor to charitable organizations, both through funding as well as volunteer time. The understanding and knowledge necessary to draft this presentation has taken decades to develop. I'd like to acknowledge a few folks who are with us today who have contributed to our region's learning over those decades. And those include Dr. John Mullen, University of Massachusetts Provost, and author of the study on the impacts of the Roe, Massachusetts nuclear power plant closure. Jim Mathau, former Executive Director of the Wyndham Regional Commission. Tom Buchanan, former Wyndham Regional Commissioner. Jeff Lewis, former BDCC Executive Director and founder of the Institute for Nuclear Host Communities. Jonathan Cooper of the Institute for Nuclear Host Communities. Kate O'Connor, Chair of ENDICAP. And Stephen Morse, Chair of the SEVIDS Post-VY Task Force. Lastly, a few thank yous. Uh, first, to the Brooks House for hosting us here today. Uh, and to the Economic Development Administration for partnering with us on this effort and to our federal delegations for being our strongest advocates and for consistently supporting our work. We look forward to the continued collaborations for the months and years ahead. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Vermont's uh, senior senator, Senator Patrick Leahy. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, I'm glad to see the 
our whole House of Representatives delegation here, <laughs> Congressman Welch, and, and Marcel and I, before we started, we were talking with the, with the whoops, sorry about that, what have I broken, uh, with, the, with the principal uh, speaker here, Matt, I want to welcome you here. I'll tell a little story. His, his children and two of our grandchildren are very good friends. And we usually see each other on, on playing fields dressed considerably differently than we are uh, tonight. But I, I think, uh, I know Vermont, all of Vermont, appreciates the investments that EDA have, been made, have made here. But I also think as you review this project, as you and your staff do, and the others that are in the wake of the Vermont Yankee closure, you're going to be impressed how we put resources together. And I hope that you will share what you learn here with others in the administration as widely as possible. But I also want to thank the people who went to work together, put this white paper together. You put something that very straightforward, very honest, that is the Vermont way, and is going to be very helpful not only to our communities, but across the country. And we can talk about how beautiful this is, and it is when Marcel and I drove down from our home in Middlesex outside of Montpelier this morning. We're thinking you can't make up how beautiful this scenery is. But it takes more than just scenery to make a good life. In the years since the, the decision to close Vermont Yankee, we've had people come together from all over government, local government, the Governor Shulman's office is re represented here, our congressional delegation. We want to understand the ramifications. And when I say the people worked on this white paper, you set aside artificial boundaries in doing it. Not just in Vermont, but I mean, Congress and Welch and I are extraordinarily proud, as, as is Bernie Sanders, to represent Vermont. But we know the closure of Vermont Yankee impacts the entire region. And the members of Congress and the Senate in New Hampshire and Massachusetts are very concerned about what happens next. And your work, as I read it, you zeroed in on one fact. There is no roadmap, no economic roadmap for communities to host nuclear plants when they close. What do you do next? We saw what happened with Irene. Nobody could have figured out exactly what to do when you get hit with a hurricane like that. But here in Vermont, we developed new tools. We put together what all of us call best practices. We responded to it, we covered from it, when well, the same way you're creating both economic development strategies, but you're doing an agenda for other communities. I think this is going to be a useful tool, not just for here, which of course is the most important. This is where we're all from. But I also think other nuclear host communities are going to look at what you do. I think uh, this will have help in the steps the Obama administration has taken to help the Appalachian region deal with the inevitable transition away from coal mining and coal-fired plants. But I see the potential for putting this to work in the forestry communities in northern New England. A lot of them have been challenged by the closure of paper mills, the collapse of markets for low-grade wood. They have questions. Uh, so we acknowledge, a, it also acknowledges a sometimes overlooked point. And can I just kind of close with this? you have the loss of a good paying large employer, it can change the social aspects of the whole community. You can lose the number of people who volunteer for good causes. Who's there for the Little League and other things? How many local leaders are willing to step up to serve on boards and community projects? There's no easy way to figure that, but we know it happens. So thank you for working on this. Vermont is in the only state, the plant facing closure, but we Vermonters seem to come together better than most. This is not a Republican or Democratic issue. It's a people issue. It's a special state issue. So I'm glad you're doing this. I intend to talk with other 
senators, and I know Peter will with other congressmen, about what is happening. And thank you. And Matt, thanks for making the trip up. Uh, I'm not sure which sweatshirt I'll be wearing the next time I see you on the playing field, but I'll have one that says something about Vermont on it. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Senator Leahy. Uh, now we'd like to introduce Vermont's Congressman Peter Welch. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you very much. You know, th this is an incredible challenge, you know, having this uh, huge facility uh, that had over 550 really good paying jobs uh, and lots of additional employment uh, as part of that. Really about a half a billion dollars of economic activity and then the employee headcount's going to go down in just a few years uh, to under 25. And that's a real challenge. Uh, fortunately, Brattleboro's ready. Uh, the region is ready. And this white paper is an indication that you want to be clear-eyed in f focusing on what the challenge is. You want to identify what needs to be done, and you want to get busy doing the work that is going to be required uh, in order uh, to revitalize uh, the region. And that's tough, but it's time for tough people to get going. And there's a couple of things I want to say. One is, this is really going to set a model it's, it's crucially important to our region here, in the county, uh, in really two states, three states. It's really, really important. But it's really going to also be a model about how other nuclear facilities are decommissioned. I mean, Vermont Yankee uh, was one of the first, if not the first, to be decommissioned. And how do you deal with that? And that's part of the challenge that Patrick and I uh, and Bernie face in Washington, because we have got to make certain that the procedures that are enacted for decommissioning decisions absolutely fundamentally include the local community. And this is a new area of work for the NRC. You know, they've been focused primarily uh, on uh, safety. They've had a focus on the nuclear industry uh, and how that uh, facility in a community uh, can be assured, it can be safe. And we've had our issues with them about that. But we're in a new place now. This is a shutdown facility that is occupying an immense asset within this region. And fundamental questions about how do we get that asset back into productive use are issues that have to have as primary their focus on the community that's affected. Because if that facility is shut down, all those jobs are gone, all that economic activity disappears, that's got to be replaced. It has to be replaced. And one of the big assets that we have is where that facility is. And this is one of the big debates that's going to happen. Do we go in the safe store, which is the preferred approach of much of the industry, where you kind of mothball it, or are we going to decommission it sooner rather than later and let communities find ways uh, to put that uh, that back to work. And we absolutely, we be in the community, have to have a place at the table constantly. And there's got to be an awareness on the part of the NRC that it's the community that's the essential player here. It's the community that is going to be essentially on the hook, not the industry. So these decisions at the NRC, as they're in rulemaking right now, and getting letters from Patrick and Bernie and me, emphasizing community involvement. That's what our job is going to be in Washington, while your job back here in the community is to build and make progress and implement uh, the recommendations of this white paper. So this is the first. And what I've seen that's inspiring me is the all-in approach that folks in the region are taking. First with this white paper, Second, with the persistent advocacy of local uh, officials saying that we want a seat at the table. Uh, and third, with our advocacy in Congress with the NRC that's in the process of rulemaking, that we want to make sure the focus is on the revitalization of communities that have been the host for this nuclear facility for so many years 
And in the case recently of a nuclear facility that was making an awful lot of money for a company, providing good jobs, yes, but making a lot of money for a company that's now leaving, but the families are left behind, the community's proud, the community wants to rebuild. Now the second thing I wanted to point out is what a better place to be doing this than in the Brooks House. I mean, I was down here the day after that fire. I just couldn't believe it. And the first responders from the fire folks to the, uh, the police, uh, to the, the hospital folks, everybody was here. They saved this building from total destruction. Nobody's life was lost, even though some folks were in apartments and had a hard time getting in and out, and they were, some of them, disabled. Every single one was rescued. And then the question is, now what? Because we had this anchor building in the heart of downtown Brattleboro, and who would have thought it would be possible to put it back together so that today we'd be in this absolutely magnificent space talking about another rebuilding challenge. And if we need an example of an impossible job that got done, it's the Brooks House. So again, I congratulate you for what you did with the Brooks House. I applaud you for your commitment to dealing with the very, very big challenge uh, of the closure of Vermont Yankee and what impact that has on the lives and the families in this community. And Patrick and Bernie and I will be there every step of the way doing every single thing we can to make certain that you get a fair shake from the NRC so that you have a shot at success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we are very pleased today to have joining us uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Matt Erskine from the U.S. Department of Commerce, and we'd like to welcome you to make some comments. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. Thank you, Laura, very much uh, for the kind introduction, and I want to thank you and Adam uh, for the warm welcome, for your leadership and service, uh, for your time today. I'm also very honored uh, to be working with Senator Leahy today and to be with you and Mrs. Leahy. It's a great pleasure. Congressman Welsh, a very big, uh, uh, big appreciation. Thank you for your leadership, both of you, uh, for helping to create economic opportunity and jobs here in Vermont and beyond. And I would also like to express my deep appreciation to you both for your support of the critical work that we do at the U.S. Economic Development Administration at the U.S. Department of Commerce to support bottom-up, regionally-led, locally-owned development strategies, focused strategies that have a real impact on transforming economies here in Vermont and across the nation. I'd also like to thank the staff from Senator Sanders' office and Governor Schumlin's office that are here with us today. Thank you for your participation, for your service, and for your partnership. And I'd like to thank the other regional partners who together with BDCC have truly demonstrated cross-state regional collaboration. Chris Campany, Linda Dunleavy, and Tim Murphy. And finally, a big thank you to the Ecovation Hub leadership team for your efforts and your great work and for the very informative roundtable that we held earlier today. You know, EDA has been a proud partner for communities in Vermont. In fact, since 2008, the U.S. Economic Development Administration, the EDA, has invested $22 million in this special state to support 25 economic development projects that are expected to help create or save more than 2,700 jobs and generate $50 million in private investment. At EDA, we play a very important role in helping communities plan, and focus on economic recovery and resilience, be it changing demographics, a natural disaster, or the closure of a major employer. And we have been pleased to work closely uh, with the Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation, the BDCC, to develop strategies designed to respond to all three of these types of challenges. And through our work together, we have been able to help the community and the region start new initiatives and spur entrepreneurial activity. So the lesson, lessons learned white paper that we unveil and celebrate today can in many ways be traced back to 2012 when EDA provided support for the Southeastern Vermont Economic Development Strategy, or SEVEDS. 
And the SEVAGE represents the best in community engagement and regional collaboration. In fact, just last month, it was recognized with the Silver Excellence Award by the International Economic Development Council. Capitalizing on the foundational work of the SEVAGE last year, last year, EDA made an investment of $265,000 to BDCC to support their green cluster analysis and implementation project a market and industry research analysis study to determine a more efficient, effective, and economical pathway to grow and expand the green building industry sectors in the southeastern Vermont region and in this greater tri-state region. Using the SEVIDs as its framework, private sector partners from the construction, manufacturing, publishing, and other industries conducted asset mapping and identified a significant regional cluster focused on green and sustainable building. And critically, the BDCC provided more than $95,000 to match our investment, represent, representing significant buy-in from the local community. The leaders from this tri-state region understand the need and the potential, the great potential, to expand the region's green and sustainable building industry sector. Currently, the region, the sector in the region produces approximately 238 million in GDP, representing more than 2,000 jobs. This is a powerful regional asset that can attract more people, more companies, which in turn can lead to economic growth and improved prosperity. Now, the national market for green goods and services is, is expected to double in the next three to five years. And the fact is, there is tremendous opportunity for this region to match that growth given the region's concentration of these jobs, the talent and expertise represented, together with the strong culture of green ethics. Continued strong regional collaboration is the key to making that happen. So to close, I'd like to highlight two important points. First, the green cluster analysis and implementation projects, project, the lessons learned white paper, and the Ecovation Hub are the result of collaboration of the tri-state region team comprised of the BDCC, the Franklin Regional Council of Governments in Massachusetts, Southwest Region Planning Commission in New Hampshire, and the Wyndham Regional Commission of Vermont. The approach taken here has the key elements for successful, long-term, sustainable economic development, built from the ground up, regional collaboration, and public-private partnership. Second, this white paper and the challenges and course of action outlined in it can and will be used by other communities that are facing similar challenges. By sharing the knowledge that you have gained and the action plans that you have put in place, other towns, regions, and communities across the nation will learn from your experience to help set their course forward. So on behalf of EDA, I commend you for your efforts and encourage you to keep moving forward on strengthening and diversifying the region's economy. EDA is committed to continuing our work with you to build a more prosperous region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, now for our main event, uh, we are presenting to you our learnings. Uh, I'd like to invite up Chris Campany, Executive Director from the Wyndham Regional Commission, Linda Dunleavy from the Franklin Regional Council of Governments, and Tim Murphy from Southwestern New Hampshire. Uh, Chris will be going over, highlighting uh, aspects of the paper. The paper is available um, on the BDCC website for downloading. After the presentation, we will be taking questions. Um, I think it's important to note, uh, Chris is the primary author. We have all contributed, but Chris's learnings, Wyndham Regional's learnings, have really led the way in the development of this paper. And so I'd ask you to help us welcome Chris and the other executive directors. Good afternoon. Um, as you'll tell from my accent, I'm a proud southeastern Vermonter. Um, <laughs> But actually, my accent, it belies another, uh, you know, we all have our lenses through which we view things. When I was growing up, in, I grew up in southwestern Virginia in a town called Abingdon. We weren't a coal town, but we were heavily influenced by the coal economy. When the bottom fell out of the coal market in 1983, 
I watched how it impacted my father's business. He was a contractor, my mom's business. She was a real estate broker and how it affected our family and how it affected our communities. And so what Vernon and our other towns have been going through with the closure of Ron Yankee, I have uh, real empathy for what these closures can mean and why it's important to be as proactive as possible uh, in planning for uh, economic disruption like this. And it's not just an economic disruption, it's a community disruption. So what we've prepared is a summary of lessons learned. Um, this was prepared by the Tri-Region team um, for lessons learned in the wake of the closure of Vermont Yankee located in uh, Vernon, Vermont. I'd just like to recognize uh, two of the Wyndham Region Commissioners, and they're from Vernon, uh, Munson Hicks and Tim Arsenault. Um, so glad to have some Vernon representatives here. Um, the Wyndham Region has hosted a nuclear power station itself, while together the tri-state region area is home to the vast majority of those employed by the plant and where the loss of Vermont Yankee employees, employee income, as well as indirect and induced job loss will be most acutely experienced. Uh, we hope our experience will empower the readers of the white paper to better know the types of questions you'll have and want to ask, the kinds of information you'll want to gather or develop, and the kinds of uh, and the things to keep in mind when organizing to act. Um, because we've been living it, we understand that this report may be of limited interest locally. Um, but we do hope our lessons learned will be helpful to other nuclear host communities, and we hope that our counterparts around the nation will be more inclined to engage in conversations with one another with their respective federal delegations and with the agencies that promulgate policies related to nuclear energy, decommissioning, spent nuclear fuel, and high-level radioactive waste, namely the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Department of Energy. I want to recognize the leadership of two people who re recognized early on, years before the closure of Vermont Yankee was announced, that how a nuclear plant closes and decommissions has significant regional socioeconomic, fiscal, and land use implications. Uh, Jim Matteau, our former executive director and, uh, of the Wyndham Regional Commission, and Tom Buchanan, former chair of the WRC's Energy Committee and Vermont Yankee Study Committee, recognized through participation in state permitting processes that uh, the different shutdown and decommissioning scenarios presented by the operators of the plant would determine whether uh, the impacts of the closure would be more gradual or acute, the standards to which the, the plant site would be restored, and how soon the site might be available for reuse after closure. And after investing significant volunteer and staff time to understand the shape and the conditions of the closure of a major local industry when closure was not imminent, that was not an obvious or easy decision. Um, and frankly, when I came on board six years ago, uh, or a little bit more as a new director, it wasn't an easy decision for me either to necessarily continue the work that they had begun. But uh, but I was convinced and the commissioner, other commissioners were convinced and we continued. So that decision enabled the WRC to provide foundational information for a post VY closure analysis led by the BDCC in 2011 and 2012 when there was concern that the denial of a certificate of public good uh, by the state could result in the plant's closure regardless of its uh, renewed license by the NRC. Uh, led us to have an established position on the region's economic and orderly redevelopment interests immediately upon the announcement of energy of its intent to close the plant. It enabled us to provide detailed information about what communities would be most affected to our own towns, to our counterparts in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, and the state and federal elected officials and policymakers. It enabled us to present a clear and detailed position and related rationale for state policymakers to understand uh, the region's needs and expectations and to establish a clear policy basis for comments on VY's post-shutdown decommissioning activities report and related site assessment, which were submitted to the NRC. I want to thank our partners uh, in the development of this paper, the BDCC, the Franklin Regional Council of Governments, and the Southwest Regional Planning Commission. I mean, change often brings opportunity, and probably one of the biggest opportunities that's come out of this um, is the realization of the extent to which our regions are inter inter interdependent, especially at the household income security level. Um, the opportunities for collaboration across a broad spectrum of issues, economic development, transportation, water quality, flood resiliency, and housing, to name a few, um, are coming into clear focus. And I'm excited about the potential for achieving uh, important things together for our communities. And I also want to thank the U.S. Economic Development Administration for providing funding to support our collaboration and to our federal delegations for their support of the U.S. EDA and its work. I'm now going to provide a brief overview of the 20 lessons learned contained within the paper. Uh, while the discussion here relates specifically to the closure of a nuclear power station in a rural area, 
The lessons learned are applicable to any locale that will or could lose a major employer, a major source of local earned income, a major contributor to the local tax base, and a major contributor to charitable organizations in terms of both funding and volunteer time. Um, there are also lessons to be learned about a major employer whose site and physical plant uh, present land use and orderly redevelopment questions, including plant decommissioning, site restoration, the presence of hazardous materials, and complex regulatory frameworks. I want to note that the perspectives we're sharing here are those of the tri-state team of regional organizations. This is not the story of the individual towns or the state, and we hope the town and the state will also share their stories. I also want to note that the impacts of the plant closure are still unfolding. Uh, since VY ceased operation in December 2014, VY has ramped down its number of personnel from approximately 550 uh, to approximately 125 as of July 2016. One spent fuel has been transferred from the spent fuel pool to dry casks, a task that should be completed by 2021. The plant will employ approximately 24 people, most of whom will be security staff. So while the closure has occurred and staff reductions are well underway, the full impacts of the closure on our communities and the local economy have yet to be realized and may not necessarily be easy to quantify or otherwise measure. So the lessons learned. Early ongoing and neutral engagement in state regulatory processes, processes enabled the host region to understand what the impacts would be when the plant would eventually close for whatever reason that might be and to develop evidence-based policy positions. Uh, by participating in state permitting processes, uh, well before the plant ever announced its intent to close, we un understood in considerable detail how many people the plant employed, in what communities they lived, employee average salaries, beneficiaries of charitable contributions, plant owner assumptions about taxes to be paid uh, post-closure, and the basis for value assessment, uh, plant owner assumptions about decommissioning site restoration and site restoration standards, plant owner assumptions about the decommissioning trust and management thereof, and the corporate structure of the plant owner, and how that structure related to decommissioning possibilities. Um, the larger lesson is that the, uh, any host community should build its knowledge base about the fiscal and socioeconomic role of a major employer in that community and what that employer intends to do if and when it ceases operation. Hopefully this information can be collected through conversations with the plant, but may also be available or supplemented through filings uh, with state or local and federal regulators. Lesson learned number three, understand the dynamics of the plant's contribution to the local economy. Economic impact analyses have been prepared for, by VY uh, and other parties for Vermont Public Service Board dockets, which described in considerable detail the socioeconomic relationships of the plant to local and state economies. This information helped inform the work of the post-Vermont Yankee working group led by BDCC, which released a study in 2012 about the impacts of the potential VY closure. Upon the announcement that VY would close, the tri-region partners recognized the need for an independent analysis of what direct, indirect, and induced effects would result from the loss of VY employees and their incomes. Franklin Regional Council of Governments was able to fund the UMass Donahue Institute uh, to conduct a study of these effects, and the study was released in December 2014 ahead of the cessation of plant operations. In our work, number, lesson learned number four, in our rural area, the greatest impacts will be the out-migration of employees and their families and the loss of their disproportionately high income circulating in the local economy. So when a nuclear plant closes, many of the employees will be able to find work elsewhere within the nuclear industry, if not within the same company. This is not to say there will not be unemployment impacts when a plant closes, but the economic impact studies can help identify what sectors will most likely be impacted. Lesson learned number five, workforce organizations don't assume you will have access to plant employees through the employer or the ability to directly communicate with those employees. Because of the nature of the work and the qualifications and clearances required, nuclear plant workers are in high demand within the industry. Employees are likely to be offered significant incentives to stay working at the plant throughout through the closure. They are then likely to be offered similar positions at a different location within the company or to stay within the industry but with a different company at a new location. Lesson learned number six, the host region has a unique role and responsibility and that's engagement and discussions around decommissioning. Communities that are home to the plant will have the unique responsibility of engaging in issues related to the decommissioning of the plant restoration of the plant site, <clears throat> and other land use and orderly redevelopment matters in local, state, and federal forums. This can challenge staff and board capacity. I'm not kidding when I say that um, 
our commissioners literally put in several hundred hours at least of their time in uh, dealing with these issues, staff wouldn't have been able to handle it all on their own. And so it's almost impossible to find resources to fund this kind of work. And this is also going to be on top of your regular duties that don't deal with nuclear power plant decommissioning. So it's not too soon to begin discussions with appropriate state agencies or legislative delegations to begin developing special funding sources for the host region to be actively engaged in decommissioning activities. The WRC estimates that we spent more than $125,000 in staff time <clears throat> on critical decommissioning related work and regional plan advocacy between 2009 and 2016 with no dedicated funding source and this stressed our organization. Number seven, understand the role of the plant in the local community and culture and what the implications of the loss of that employer means. So underlying the number of employees, spouses and children are relationships. These are neighbors, family and friends. They are children in schools, coaches on soccer and baseball fields, <clears throat> volunteers in fire departments, customers in stores, contributors to nonprofits and households and neighborhoods. Closure and mitigation planning will seek to minimize disruption to these relationships or the effects of the loss of these relationships throughout the social fabric of communities. You'll want to ask to what extent is the employer responsible <coughs> for organizing and convening civic activities that might otherwise be the purview of local civic organizations. And I know that Vernon has been having these discussions about what was the role of VY and then how do we kind of rebuild this fabric ourselves without having that kind of major organizing presence within the community. Number eight develop a basic understanding of the industry, the financial well-being of the plant within the marketplace and within its family of companies and any regulatory issues it might be facing. 14 reactor units have been closed at 11 plant sites since October 2012 and many of these had already obtained 20-year license extensions from the US from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Communities with nuclear power plants in their service region should research the economic performance of these plants relative to other power generators as well as any regulatory issues that may contribute to a decision to close a reactor prior to the expiration of its license to understand what the risks of closure might be. You don't have to be an expert, but just look at the trade publications, uh, look at whatever information you can about the business within the region. Number nine, if you have already developed a comprehensive economic development strategy or SEDS or other uh, economic development plan in which you have confidence, pursue it. If you have a federally approved SEDS uh, economic development strategy in place before the closure or other well thought out economic development plan, then you've already got a path to follow. Ideally, it should contain planning to mitigate the economic and decommissioning impacts expected after a closure, but if it doesn't, the economic development plan or strategy should still provide a preliminary foundation for action, assuming it reflects other economic development uh, assets to be built upon. And while the announcement of a closure may create a greater sense of urgency, it may not necessitate a need for a change in the direction of an established strategy unless that strategy is dependent upon the continued operation and existence of the plant. The energy sector is particularly volatile at this time for a number of reasons. Um, and it is our suggestion that communities which host power stations of any sort, and also which may be dependent upon the generation of fuel of any sort, consider the place of that facility in the local economy and how the potential clo closure could inform the economic development strategy for the area. Lesson 10, planning for the eventual closure of a plant may be viewed by some, <coughs> including the employer, as not supporting or otherwise being against the employer. What may seem objectively rational to the planning and economic development organization may be viewed by others as a suspicious or hostile act. An employer and its supporters may view the effort as assuming weakness or vulnerability or in support of those opposed to its continued operation. Conversely, those opposed to the employer may look at the effort to understand the economic and fiscal impacts of a closure as an attempt to justify or bolster its continued operation and existence. Having an objective conversation about the role of the employer in the economy and what might happen should the employer cease to exist requires trust building, outreach, and diplomacy on all sides. In the development of its Wyndham County post-VY economic mitigation and growth study, the BDCC brought both supporters and opponents together to assess the impacts of the closure. And within our energy committee uh, at the Wyndham Regional Commission, we also had supporters and opponents. 
Number 11, when it comes to a nuclear plant, how it chooses to decommission will have a major impact on the rate of change. I'm not going to go, this is, this, this is a topic unto itself. Um, and I won't go deep into it, but basically to say there's it's basically two pathways, decon, which is prompt decommissioning, and safe store, which is deferred decommissioning. A plant can defer decommissioning for up to 60 years. So the more gradual fall off of economic activity and employment associated with decon offers the region social, economic, and fiscal benefits that safe store does not. Um, previously, nuclear power stations uh, operated by public utilities would go uh, the decon route as it was less expensive and costs could be passed along to tax to ratepayers. Most of the plants that have closed or have announced their intent to close over the last four years are merchant plants and they're choosing the safe store option to defer decommissioning until their decommissioning trusts are sufficient to cover the radiological decommissioning costs because merchant plants don't have the ability to pass on those decommissioning costs to ratepayers once they cease operation. Lesson learned number 12, understand the regulatory context that governs the plant while it is operational and after operations cease. Host communities may be surprised how little public engagement is required by federal regulators. In the case of a nuclear power station, the NRC requires public involvement at only two specific points in a decommissioning planning process. So think ahead about how the community may want to organize itself to better engage with regulatory authorities at the state and federal levels and when engaging with the federal authorities, local communities may want to explore opportunities for coordination and collaboration with state agencies because, frankly, they've got the bandwidth to better participate. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, local and state interests may be, may be the same or complementary in many respects, but anticipate that there may be some differences. Number 13, community advisory panels can be very effective but should operate independent of the plant and should have autonomy from any state entities that will advise. Uh, the Vermont Yankee, the Vermont Nuclear De Citizens Decommission, uh, the Vermont Indicap, the Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel was created through a settlement agreement arrived at between the State of Vermont and Entergy Vermont Yankee, has played an essential role in providing a forum for public engagement in the decommissioning of the plant, um, and it really has been an important way to get uh, all the different parties uh, talking to one another in a public forum. Um, we do advise that community panels, that the advisory panels uh, operate independent of the plant operator and also independent of the state so they really can be local. That does not mean though that you don't want those people on that panel, you do. Um, lesson learned number 14, local en entities should have access to their own experts to make sense of information provided by the plant, public agencies and advocacy organizations. Uh, the plants are going to have their information and their experts. The state is going to have their information and their experts. Um, research shows that people are much more trusting of uh, information if they have their own experts to make sense of it, and it's just good practice. Number 15, support for and opposition of the plant does not go away with its closure. I would encourage everybody to read uh, uh, Xenia Coteval and John Mullen's uh, study of the closure of Vermont of Yankee Row. Um, they go into this in some detail, but don't assume that just because the plant closes that the camps go away. They don't. Um, number 16, there's no national model for economic impact mitigation. Um, it's important that host community or region is able to understand and articulate how it will be impacted by using historical data, community, imp uh, community input, and impact modeling to develop strategies to address those impacts and communicate um, all of the above publicly. 17, there's no dedicated funding stream to assist communities with the economic impact mitigation of nuclear plant closures. You'll, you'll need to piece together other federal, state, and local resources. Uh, congressional earmarks were used in the past by, other, by uh, host communities to um, develop mitigation strategies. Um, those don't exist anymore. So you'll need to make use of programs offered by entities such as the U.S. EDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and uh, the U.S. Department of Housing and Community Development. There may be, a, number 18, there may be a tendency to look for a solution at the plant site. It's not uncommon to assume that the solution that will help mitigate the impacts of the closure of a major employer lies within the site of the business that is closing. But with nuclear plants, it's a very complex regulatory environment. You've got a nuclear plant sitting there, you've got spent fuel sitting there. Uh, you're probably not going to get access to that site um, until uh, those things are removed. So you probably need to look at land elsewhere. 
Number 19, there may be a tendency and temptation to look for a single big solution to replace what is lost, such as employees' income or tax revenue, but that can stymie progress to be had through a series of smaller solutions. So that's not to say you don't have big aspirations, but be conscious of the extent to which it might avoid, uh, it might preclude pursuit of the improbable perfect in lieu of the achievable good. And lastly, there currently exists no federal nuclear power plant decommissioning policy, but the NRC is in the process of decommissioning rulemaking, so please get involved. Uh, we need host communities to, be, to work together, to engage with one another. Um, ideally, host communities, with the help of their federal lawmakers, will compel the NRC and the DOE and other agencies to convene and engage with host communities in the development of policy that takes into account and is responsive to the communities that are most directly impacted by nuclear plant closures. We're grateful for the support we received from Senator Leahy, Senator Sanders, and Congressman Welch in support of our advocacy for this to happen. And now I will turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you very much, Chris. Don't go too far. Um, so we'd like to open it up to questions from the press. Do we have any questions? To what degree does the, does the white paper address essentially the um, uh, bootstrap initiatives of the local community? Um, we, in, we in Vernon are, are working uh, in order to uh, create our own uh, experience in order to um, encourage economic development. To what degree does this white paper support that initi those initiatives? So Munson, this looks more at what's happening at the regional level. Um, and that's why I would, because it is more of what, of the kind of the regional experience. Didn't want to speak for the towns in this case. But we're absolutely standing by to help the towns um, with their bootstrap efforts to try to help them pull themselves up. And, you know, I think New England may be somewhat unique in that our units of government are relatively small um, and that towns are left to, d to do a lot of fending for themselves. In other parts of the country, a lot of this responsibility is going to fall to, a, to counties or at the county scale. Um, and so the main thing that I would say the smaller units of government can do, what the towns can do, is reach out to the regional partners and we're happy to help you figure out maybe what those bootstrap initiatives might be. We can help, facil we can have, help facilitate conversations so that the town figures that out on their own. And once you identify them, we're happy to help you know, figure out how do you pursue them, how do you get funding to pursue them. Um, and again, just how do you have those conversations within the town. And I think one of the biggest challenges I think that a number of t communities probably face is just even how do you have the conversation within the town itself about what the future is going to be. And it's really easy, I know, to focus on how do we just replace the plant as opposed to what is the future of the town without that uh, plant that we really kind of grew up around, right? So uh, we're here to help, and, uh, but we're looking for your all's direction about what you need from us. Um, I'm sort of curious about the, um, when it was that it was clear to Tim and Linda when the regional, tri-regional sort of component was able to sort of, was it from some of the data you were seeing in some of the permitting process that Chris mentioned earlier, or when was it that the, uh, that it was clear to you both as well that there would be impacts in your necks of the woods? Uh, we had actually started working with the Wyndham Regional Commission uh, more than 20 years ago, Susan and I worked together on a project, and we started getting together formally as the executive directors. Yeah, so we were working on projects ahead of time, and it was with the announcement that we really started amping up those projects, recognizing that the employment loss was going to hit not just Vermont, but New Hampshire and Massachusetts as well. I think it's maybe in part to your question, and Tim Murphy, and I'm from uh, the other side of the river in New Hampshire, um, and, and so um, we weren't looking um, at this issue. VY closure was not on our radar, and so when the uh, news came out, it was a kick in the pants. And when I heard the previous question, my, my first re thought was, well, it uh, would have been nice to have this report uh, ahead of time, and so perhaps maybe that's what this report can be for others. 
Yeah, thank you very much. So this is a question for Congressman Welch, and um, I'm pleased to say that Congressman Welch is a co-sponsor of H5 5632, and 5632 is a bipartisan bill sponsored by Robert Dold, Representative Robert Dold, and what it deals with is the stranded nuclear waste, um, and uh, it proposes to compensate communities like ours that will be the host communities uh, in perpetuity for the nuclear waste that has nowhere to go at this point in time. Thank you. You know, the nuclear waste is a huge issue, uh, totally unresolved. I mean, the big promise was that we were going to have Yucca Mountain and the waste from all the nuclear facilities would go there. Uh, but the way it's worked out, everywhere there's a nuclear facility, that's become the permanent storage site that's unacceptable. So there's a couple of things. One, is there going to be compensation for communities that are bearing that burden? Because that has always been a concern, a legitimate one, and a worry for the community. Uh, Mr. Dold is a Republican, but he has a nuclear plant in his facility. We've got the same problem, and we're trying to see if we can resolve it. Uh, I've got other legislation uh, with Mike Conaway as a Republican from Texas where there is a location in Texas that actually uh, they have a site uh, for, quote, temporary until Yucca Mountain is resolved. And uh, that is a possibility. And again, it's something where you've got a location now where in that area they actually believe that it would be in their interest to have it. There's some contention, obviously, in that community. Uh, but if we had an alternative to permanent storage right here and at other uh, waste sites around, then obviously that would help us along the way. So there's a number of us in Congress who come from regions where we have a nuclear facility that are trying to find a better answer to the status quo. So do you have any Well, you know, it, it, uh, you probably have noticed this, but uh, we're three weeks away from an election. And a lot of, <laughs> a lot of things are going to change, and a lot of things are being held in abeyance. But what I've seen is that this question that we're facing uh, in this community is a question that other communities are facing. And it's not a red state, blue state deal. I mean, you've got communities that want to revitalize their community. And they've got this problem... Um, of, of nuclear waste. So that's the common ground that gives me some optimism in just this cross-section. You know, Mike Conaway is a very conservative Republican from Texas, uh, but he's working with me on this. Uh, and it's not because he thinks I'm a good guy or I think he's a good guy. I mean, he is a good guy, but it's because we've got a common problem. We figure if working together, we might have a better shot at fixing it. Okay, thanks. Hey, Laura, can I have one? I just want to say, too, that in my experience, um, Vermont elected officials are just incredibly easy to access relative to any other. I've lived in a lot of states, nothing like it. But also, I've been really impressed at how well their staffs work together. Um, if there's any contention, I've never seen it. Uh, but it's amazing how well they work together as a team to make things happen. I really, really appreciate that. Do we have any other questions before we close? Uh, the paper has been loaded up. It is on the BDCC site. All of the contact information for all of the directors is here. And uh, you certainly can contact them uh, for additional questions. Anything else today? Just thank you to Laura for your leadership on oh. this too. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.